Okay, an official welcome everybody on this balmy Missouri evening here. It's about 80 degrees here in central Missouri tonight. Uh, my name is Dana Ripper and also with me is Ethan Duke. We're with the Missouri River Bird Observatory or MRBO. Our mission is conservation via science, education, and advocacy. Um, we've put on this webinar series to hopefully inform folks and inspire them to action. And I think that everyone tonight is going to be inspired to action by Dr. Ptolemy because that is what he does. Um, Doug Ptolemy is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He has authored 112 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 43 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His books include Bringing Nature Home, The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, and The Nature of Oaks, winner of the American Horticultural Society's 2022 Book Award. In 2021, he co-founded Homegrown National Park with Michelle Alfandari, and we'll put that link in the chat. Um, I also want to note that it is a prevailing opinion that this gentleman has sparked a revolution in home gardening with native plants across the country. So we are so pleased and so honored to have Dr. Doug Talmy. Go ahead and take it away, sir. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, Let's talk about nature's best hope or my idea of what nature's best hope is. And I'll give you a spoiler. You're nature's best hope. So I'm really going to talk about why I think so. But before we do that, let's talk about what E.O. Wilson's idea of nature's best hope was. The late E.O. Wilson, I should say. <clears throat> he died two years ago. But one of the things that was consistent throughout his extremely long career was his love of, of biodiversity, his love of life on, on Earth. And his efforts to save it. And he wanted to save it not just because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. He said, if we don't do that, it's going to disappear everywhere. And that includes humans. Well, uh, that's a great message to a conservation biologist. We'll just put half the earth aside and all those things that are in trouble can be in that half and, and then uh, we can be in the other half and, and it'll be great. Problem is half of terrestrial earth is already in some form of agriculture and I don't see that going away. Uh, and we've got us, we've got 8 billion people with all of our hardscape and airports and detritus in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how are we going to realize E.O. Wilson's dream? That's really what I want to talk about tonight. I think we can do it. I think we can do it, but we need a new approach to conservation to do it. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened in 2019, uh, at least in the East, and then this year across much of the country. We had a very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time, and that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it's too little hole for its head. Then it forced its head through there. And it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. And once it's out of the acorn, it's a very dangerous time for this insect because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. It takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly, stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do. But that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that is how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year the way most insects would? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they left the acorn. 
And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move, time to move the colony, grab the larvae, grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new acorn. <clears throat> that takes about 30 minutes. And then they post a guard here, make sure nobody else comes in. And that is where they will live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point with this little story? Well, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn fly up to a mile, mile and a half from the parent tree. Then they tap that acorn beneath the soil surface. And the object is they're going to go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three, three oak trees. And a single jay can bury 4,500 acorns each fall. Specialized rel uh, relationship between pileated woodpeckers peckers, and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have woolly pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants. You won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilia, unless you have facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got uh, between 3,600 and 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. The point I want to make, though, is that Today, many, most of these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the lower 48 states as they were. There's only about 5% of the country that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state, and those are largely mountaintops. Well, that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. <clears throat> of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. You can spell that any way you want. We polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need, because it is nature, it is functional ecosystems that keep us alive on this planet. So you might wonder why we've done that. I wonder why we've done that, uh, and I don't know, but I, I suspect that we thought our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline, followed by this one. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Now, the UN is predicting that we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. And they made this prediction two years ago, so I guess it's the next 18 years now. It's a prediction, but it's one <clears throat> that we have to make sure it does not come, come to pass, because these are the species that keep us alive on this planet. We're talking about serious, serious stuff here. Now, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment. And as Shakespeare would say, upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talks about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Uh, decades ago, way back in the 50s, Edwin Wade Teal said, we cannot make the world uninhabitable for other forms of life and have it habitable for ourselves. This is just such common sense. Maybe it's so so common sense that nobody realizes it. I don't know. Let's return briefly to this headline. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson, because he told us what would happen if Earth lost its insects. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper. 
the little things that run the world. <clears throat> and again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, and our mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our birds, we can save our insects, we can save nature itself, but we are gonna have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on every day, like oxygen, pretty important, clean water, also important, plants are cleaning our water and slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of that carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon they fix through photosynthesis into the ground where it's extremely stable. Plants are building topsoil. They're holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight into food. If we lose plants, we're going to have to eat sunlight and we will lose weight. What are animals doing for plants? They're providing pest control services. They're pollinating nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They're dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroys the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people demanding more and more ecosystem services every day. <clears throat> now we do have parks, we do have preserves. They're doing the best they can, but it's obviously not good enough, which is why we are in the sixth great extinction event that planet has ever experienced. To me, the, the answer is obvious. We now need to start practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. Now, there have been uh, uh, visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans need to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent he wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups been good at doing that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another place, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Adel Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. <clears throat> but he believed we, we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, was creating a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together. We cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was, was uh, deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day. It hasn't left. It's still in our own culture. But he may not have recognized it as an option. So what I want to argue this evening is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every day, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. Most of the lower 48 states is privately owned, 78% privately owned. 85.6% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail, and failure is not an option. Now, when you use the word conservation, uh, I'm not using it exactly the way I mean. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there, absolutely. <clears throat> and there's quite a bit of nature left in, in Missouri. We certainly want to preserve that. That has been our conservation model uh, for the last 100 years, and we want to keep doing that. But 
it's not good enough. So now we have to go beyond conservation into restoration. We have to rebuild nature in as many of the places where we've destroyed her as possible. And somebody's going to say, well, there's no way you can put it back together again exactly the way it was. And you're probably right. We've changed too many things. Uh, but we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions that I opened the talk with to create functional ecosystems once again, even if it's not exactly what was on a particular space at some point in the past. But in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most powerful groups. And there's two groups we can't do without. <clears throat> One is the flowering plants. And of course, the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is the food that just about all the animals on, on the planet depend on. So now we have the food that animals need locked up in plant tissues, mostly leaves. Well, it turns out that most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects and not just any insects. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and failed ecosystems. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, that's a chickadee that I have in, in uh, my house in southeast Pennsylvania. Not sure which chickadee you have. You may have the black cat chickadee, but you may have this guy. Practically the same bird doing the same thing. These are the birds at our feeders all winter long, eating seeds, and we tend to think that's all chickadees need. Well, even in the wintertime, only 50% of their diet is, is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. And when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. And that is typical for most of the birds out there. The babies cannot eat seeds, so they switch to invertebrates. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars, and one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. Thin wrapper is his exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible. And because they're soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. The beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They are nutritious. They're high in fat, high in protein. Low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles, Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. Uh, and a lot of beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out that, that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? Well, from those prey items they bring back to the nest. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of most bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many do they need? Is one or two enough? Or one or two a day enough? It's a good question. So let's go back to Carolina chickadee. A lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of Carolina chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, and that, that depends on the number of chicks in the nest. 
After they leave the nest, the, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count that. Uh, and, and well, that means it, it takes, you know, tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce to the point uh, where they're independent. And of course, after they're independent, they keep eating caterpillars. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, because in so many places, that's all we have is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees and other birds are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. They're foraging about 50 meters from the nest. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group who said that we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the, the uh, terrestrial bird species in North America into two groups, the species that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. So things like doves and finches and crossbills can actually make a little milk out of the seeds they eat. And that's what they rear their young on. <clears throat> and look, they didn't lose any numbers at all uh, in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. Now, this doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. And look, it is not just uh, uh, small birds that need insects. This is a kestrel eating a white line sphinx caterpillar. And it's not just birds that need caterpillars. This is the ornate box turtle. I believe you've got ornate box turtles and used to have them anyway. They used to be very common in the Midwest. They used to chase cutworm and armyworm populations around and eat hundreds of caterpillars a day. So I think we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to do one thing, be pretty. Now we're going to ask them to do two things, be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. And that's not going to happen unless you put those caterpillars back. So how do we add caterpillars to landscapes? Well, you put the plants that support those caterpillars into the landscapes. That seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the plants that do support a lot of caterpillars, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the Bradford pear and all of the burning bush and all the privet and all the calorie pear and all the, oh, I already said that, all of the, the barberry and the burning bush and the, the camellias and the hostas and the ginkgos, all the things we typically landscape with in our landscapes, and we won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a new monarch butterfly is one of the milkweeds. That is called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why is that? Well, plants don't want to be eaten. Plants have made them specialize because they don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from, their sun, from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat particular plants, the ones for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around the plant defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of interacting with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not going to start to make a living on hostas. We know this. The monarch is, has two choices then. It is locked into eating milkweed, so it's going to fly away and find milkweed someplace else if it can or starve to death. 
This is this is very simple. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that remove energy from local food webs. Very best example of a contributor is one of our oaks. Uh, they are contributing more energy to local food webs than any other type of plant by far. Good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. You know, it's good to a plant, it has nice fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to the local food web. And a good example of a detractor would be the, the calorie pear, the Bradford pear, or any of those uh, invasive ornamentals that don't pass on much energy, but they do escape our yards and become major invasive species in natural areas where they push out plants that do contribute energy. So the net result is they've removed energy from the local food web. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. We are not going to be able to rebuild ecosystems uh, if we don't have functional food webs in those ecosystems. And we're not going to have functional food webs unless we choose the right plants. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it works when we do choose the right plants, starting with my house, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm sitting in that window right now. This is where we moved in the year 2000. Uh, my wife and I, my wife, Cindy, to a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. It was a very old farm, been farmed almost 300 years. And the last thing they did before uh, we moved in was to mow it for hay. Uh, so there are very, very few plants. There are very few woody plants for sure. And our job was to put this, this little ecosystem back together again, which we had never done before. So we didn't know what we were doing. But one of the things I wanted to, to uh, try was to see whether if I put one of those caterpillars host plants in here, would the caterpillar come? Could I reestablish a relationship with a particular species of, of caterpillar? And the first one I started with was the Canadian owlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. That's what it looks like, pretty little thing. That's what the adult looks like, just like a, a leaf. But you're not going to have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow rue. That's their host plant. We didn't have any meadow rue. I'm sure it grew here 300 years ago, but the place was farmed to death, so uh, no meadow rue. So I got some seeds from someplace. I planted them. They grew very nicely. Uh, but this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owls would be able to find my tiny patch of meadow rue. So I didn't even go out and, and check it for at least two months after I planted it. Then I was walking by for another reason, and I looked over, and it was covered with Canadian owlets. They'd found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. So now we have a good population of Canadian owlets and meadow rue. We've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway, that beautiful moth that's actually a misnomer, has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. We didn't have any Biden's aristosa, but I did know where there were some Biden's in a power line cut about 14 miles away. Uh, so I got some Biden seeds. I planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, last year they took over in my front yard. That's okay. Uh, well, I had to wait a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my patch of Bidens, but it did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species to the property. Wanted to see if the hackberry emperor could, could come to our house. Uh, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that should be on our property. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtis, and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted a couple of hackberry trees, had to wait four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry, but they did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So now we've added six species. That is how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arsidra of a flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. There are 110 species of moths that use goldenrod in the mid-Atlantic states. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear some people don't like it, but I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. Excuse me. It's a good ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. And by valuable, I mean they're high in fat. Our migrating birds need sources of fat. And our, our overwintering birds need sources of fat to get them through the winter. I planted Virginia creeper. Well, before I move to that, these berries come from tiny little inconspicuous flowers. You don't even know when Virginia creeper is in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees 
around your plant. It turns out that Virginia creeper is, is one of our very best pollinator plants. So remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it is the best source of the large sphinx moth caterpillars that are an important component of cardinal diets. Things like Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Want to see if I get the double tooth prominent to make a living at our house just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Looks like a stegosaurus. <clears throat> and if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like this guy. It's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we didn't have any American elm. We lost it decades ago to the Dutch elm disease. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make a lot of seed. So I think the second year after we moved in, I gathered up some of those seeds from the gutter. Native planting is not that hard. They germinate in six days. They grow very quickly. Today, those trees are over 80 feet tall. And yes, they brought in the double tooth prominent. Another big success, American elm. I want to see if I get the evening primrose moth to make a living at our house because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I, I uh, planted some. The moth did come, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's always very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, these are just examples of the plants we put back on our property, but I want to focus on, on uh, oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Um, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, and that's a new goal in our landscaping. You can enjoy it the very first year. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two-foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. Uh, and immediately they started to call in the moths that make the caterpillars that run the food web at our house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the medium dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. People say, oh no, he's going to kill the tree. He's not going to kill the tree. Another bird's going to come eat him in the next 20 minutes. So you don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute to the local food web. It will do it immediately. This is what our house looks like in the summertime, taken from uh, about the same place I took that first picture. <clears throat> we put some plants back. I mean, that's the only point here. Not all of them, still working on it. But my research uh, over the last 20 years has shown that if you know the number of species of moths in your local food web, moths, not, not, cat, not uh, butterflies. Butterflies are bad tasting, day flying moths which means they're not contributing much to the local food web. So if you know the number of species of moths in your food web, you have a very good index of how stable that food web is uh, and how productive it is, how many species it's, it's supporting. So six years ago, I made it a goal to try, to try to take a picture of every species of moth that's living on our property now. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,259 species of moths because we put the plants back. Now we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 29.4 million acres. So on one 2.29 millionth of the land mass, tiny, tiny, tiny bit of Pennsylvania, um, we've got 48% of all of the moths that occur in the entire state because we put the plants back. And because so many of these are, are types of bird food, we have recorded 62 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why? Because we've got the bird food. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. Earth has lost two-thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. 
But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could turn this around. But will it work in suburbia? Much smaller, smaller plots. That's a very good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. You might know Margie and Dan. Um, they're on 0.6 acres in the middle of a development. All their neighbors had the big lawn. When they moved into their yard, uh, their, their, uh, the property was choked with bush honeysuckle, armor honeysuckle, another invasive from Asia. So they got rid of that. We planted 70 species of native plants put in a bubbler that they call a, or a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they start to count the birds that are using their yard. And they're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just in comparison, we've recorded uh, only eight warbler species at our house and we've got 18 times more land than they do. So does it work on, on uh, smaller plots? Yes, indeed it does. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago, and I mean in Chicago, her property abuts O'Hare Airport. She has one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. So she is a tiny island in the middle of Chicago. Uh, it's a pretty island because Pam is a native plant landscaper and she knows what she's doing. Just remember this picture. Next time somebody says you can't use native plants attractively, remember Pam's house. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, including a water feature. And then she sat back and she says, with a glass of wine and started to count the birds that are using her property. And she's up to 125 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we need to succeed in a, in a big way. Uh, and one of those things is we've got to address those big lawns. We've got the latest figure, so it's 44 million acres of lawn in this country. It's going up. It's not going down. That is an area bigger than all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, it's a status symbol. And we need to display our Halloween decorations and our Christmas decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? We're not gonna get rid of lawn. It's a wonderful cue for care. What if we cut that area of lawn in half? What if we took spaces like this and we turned them into this? Now this is a young planting. I got it from Dan Getman in Missouri, I guess. I've never met Dan, but he said, yeah, I got this big yard and I'm, I'm planting it. And he sent me this picture. Well, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We're gonna cut that in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that like Dan, we can convert, we can restore right at home. That's enough acreage to create a new national park that we're calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. At up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park is going to be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? What do we get when we put some part of nature right where we live? We get the opportunity to interact with nature, which, by the way, is a very healthy thing to do. And we could do it at our own time and our own pace. All we have to do is go outside or maybe even look out the window. We can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people there with you. That was the figure last year. So I know what you're really going to interact with. <clears throat> it's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what government closure or pandemic comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. Alone, not mediated by somebody else. You get to develop your own personal, unique relationship with Mother Nature. And this is particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louv. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour. They go to a natural area and they walk around. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home and that is their relationship with, with mother nature. 
which I'm sure is better than nothing, but it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right in their yard, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it, become friends with it, fall in love with it, alone, no parental supervision. When we hover over our kids, we are sending the message that this is dangerous stuff. This is something you should fear. We're taking away any opportunity for them to be, be creative with nature. It's a terrible message to be sending to our kids, the future stewards of the planet. If they're afraid of stewarding the planet, if they don't know what good stewardship is, if they don't love being a steward of the planet, they're going to be lousy stewards. We can't afford any more lousy stewardship. Maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. Learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of lawn with a hedge. But there are no lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe very seriously how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, it's a serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put the lizard in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it. You learn how to be a good steward of that piece of nature. You fall in love with that piece of nature. I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture not too long ago. But I guarantee she's going to remember these interactions with nature the rest of her life, and I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of them. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it. We're a real thing now, a small nonprofit. Go to homegrownnationalpark.org uh, and register your property on the map. It is free. All you do is you put... Uh, your location, and the amount of area of your property you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to, to uh, reduce the area of lawn. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. doesn't matter how small it is. Then you record that area, and your little piece of, of your county is going to light up. You'll get to see who else in your county has joined Homegrown National Park. Uh, you'll also get to see how your state is doing. The greener your state is, the more people have joined Homegrown National Park. Canada gets to play this game too now. Um, so our mission is very simple. We want to regenerate biodiversity by motivating millions of people to plant natives, remove invasive species from their properties. In other words, reshape their relationship with, with nature. We want that message to go viral. We want the entire country to light up. What are we asking? Well, we really are asking people to reduce the area of lawn. Lawn doesn't accomplish any of the ecological goals our properties have to accomplish. And replace that lawn with the native plants that do accomplish those goals. We wanna remove invasive plants from our property. Most people do have invasive plants on their property and they don't even know it. We wanna protect any natural areas. If our property is already doing that, we wanna keep doing that for sure. There are uh, real measurable ecological products associated with homegrown national park. Uh, and a big one is a significant increase in biodiversity. Decide, look at what's happened at our house. Nature is resilient. You put those plants back, she will rebound. Measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody got rid of the invasive species just on their property, we'd be 78% done. We'd be 85% done in the East. A very good first step. Significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. You know, turf grass, lawn, is a very worse plant for sequestering carbon. So if we, if we remove half the lawn and put in other plants, we will sequester a lot of carbon, store a lot of carbon, and thus help climate change. <clears throat> and we're also going to start to create viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Any bit of conservation we do outside of a park is going to help conservation inside of the park. Got real sociological products associated with Homegrown National Park as well. One's national awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and what our roles in those solutions are. We are trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional. It's not there just for our entertainment. It's essential, and it's essential for everybody, and that means everybody owns responsibility to sustaining it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's even better. And we want to merge the existing uh, wildlife uh, or, or conservation organizations 
in this this country. Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Sierra Clubs, all the land conservancies. They're doing wonderful conservation on private property, but nobody's measuring it in one visual that we call the biodiversity map. Remember, we've got a 30 by 30 initiative in this country. We're going to save 30% of the country by 2030. Not if we don't count conservation on private property. Uh, so we're going to reduce the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that was once lawn? <clears throat> Did I mention the Homegrown National Park is free? It is free. doesn't cost you anything. I'm going to argue that some of the plants that we replace lawn with have to be keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because those are the plants making most of the food. They're making most of the caterpillar food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants as the two by fours in the ecological house that you're building. They're the support system. Your house is not gonna stand up without them. We can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our ornamental plants for the last century. What's the best keystone plant? We already mentioned uh, it's one of the oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars. If you compare that to tulip trees, they're, they're good native plants, but they only support 21. So there's a huge difference among our native plants. Over 950 species nationwide. Again, no other, no other plant comes close to that. How do you know what the best plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of the most important woody and herbaceous plants in your county will pop up. These are abbreviated lists because I ran out of room. So the old excuse of, I don't know what to plant. Uh, it's just an excuse now. You do know that, what to plant, go to Native Plant Finder and it's all there. So we are going to shrink the lawn. We're going to use keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. It turns out light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline, something we never even thought about. And these are all the ways that lights are killing our nocturnal insects, uh, particularly the moths that make the caterpillars that run our food web. To me, this is good news. It's good news because we have to stop insect declines. We've got to reverse it. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet. And if we can turn that around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick, but there's a lot of us to flick those switches. But I know what, what some people are going to say. I cannot turn the light out over my barn or over my garage or over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your light. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going you're gonna to realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that even easier, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow incandescent, yellow LED, you can get them at the hardware store. Yellow wavelengths do not attract nocturnal insects. Uh, this is the easiest cure of our all of our serious problems. If we were to switch out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars too. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to modify our light system. Then we're going to invite one of the mosquito foggers to come kill all of our insects. Booming business around the country. And they say it's okay because what we're fogging is a natural organic product. And they're correct. It is a natural organic problem, product. made. It's pyrethroids made by uh, chrysanthemums. That is the, uh, the insecticide that chrysanthemums make to keep the insects off. Uh, but cyanide is a natural organic product. Ricin is a natural organic product. Nicotine is a natural organic product. So being a natural organic doesn't mean it won't kill you. Uh, they also say it only kills mosquitoes. I wish they were right about that, but not even close to right. Um, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with, including our poor beleaguered monarchs. This is a result of a mosquito fogging event on Kent Island uh, in the Chesapeake a couple of years ago. So my friend, he happened to be there and he, he picked up this handful of dead monarchs, but he said there were thousands there because it was during a migration event. It just illustrates this mosquito fogging kills everything, including those pollinators that we're trying to, to save. The interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. 
In order to control mosquitoes, you have to kill 90% of the adults. The adults is not the stage we should be targeting. These guys kill between 10 and 50%. So they're not even close to control. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. And this is something the homeowner can do. You get a bucket and you fill it full of water and you put in a handful of straw or hay or, or leaves or some organic material. Um, put it out in the sun for a couple of days and it will build up uh, a population of diatoms and larvae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. Uh, so this becomes an irresistible brew to any, any mosquito female that wants to lay her eggs in your yard. She will preferentially lay them in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12 for a season's worth of control. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a uh, natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. It's targeted, it's cheap, and if everybody did it, it would work. And guess what? This works too. Get a fan, put it on your picnic table. You can sit there and enjoy your drinks in the afternoon. Just sit in the directed breeze of your fan. Mosquitoes don't fly into that. And so you can enjoy your yard without killing anything. Um, there's the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about how we landscape under our trees. Now, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete the development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and, and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish growing as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree, wiggle their way underneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. It's messy. And we mow and compact the area under our tree so that they are rock hard, particularly in the summertime, uh, which makes it very difficult for those caterpillars to get underground. These are oak trees. They're calling in uh, moths to lay their eggs. They become an ecological trap if the caterpillars can't complete their development. And I am convinced that the way we landscape under our trees is another major cause of insect decline around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. So what most people do, you've got a tree in a yard. I've got a grad student, Emma Jonas, this year measuring how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. <clears throat> but I guarantee they're going to do better in a layered landscape like this, where you have a tree, uh, and you, this is called soft landing. The caterpillars fall down. The ground is not compacted because nobody's mowing it. Nobody's walking on it. They can easily get underground and pupate or pupate in the leaf litter that's down here. Much higher survivorship. And by the way, your trees will love this type of a landscape. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, folks. Put big pet beds around all of your trees and all of a sudden you have less lawn. Again, the trees will love it and so will the caterpillars. Use your, your native ground covers liberally like uh, wild ginger, this is native pachysandra. There's Virginia creeper as a great ground cover. Golden seal, may apples, foam flower ferns. There's a lot of choices. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants. Again, your tree will love it and so will those caterpillars. Former grad student Desiree Narango. Uh, did some great work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And her results suggest there's actually room for compromise in our, our plant choices. And that's good news. She had one simple question. How well do chickadee populations do in suburban landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by typical introduced ornamentals. When they're dominated by the introduced ornamentals, they support 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They're 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So everybody had a nest box up, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough, not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to breed. If they did try to breed, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass, from none to 100%, this is what you get. We looked at woody plants because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. 
Now, this dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything uh, above this line here, you have a growing population. And that's what happens when you have very few non-native non -native plants. But when you dip below the line here, when you have a lot of non-native plants, then you're making fewer babies than adults die. You may have an unsustainable shrinking population. Now, right here, very liberally speaking, is where those lines uh, intersect, which means this is your area of compromise. It suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. Now, we can't tolerate any invasives here. So no, no calorie pair, no burning bush. Uh, no barberry, <clears throat> but there's a lot of ornamentals that are not invasive. Remember Dan Getman? This is a, a ginkgo tree. Why does Dan have a ginkgo tree in his native planting here? Well, Dan's wife likes ginkgos and Dan likes his wife, so he planted a ginkgo. But the question is, is this ginkgo destroying the ecological productivity of this landscape? No. Is it going to escape and become a serious invasive species in the local woodlot? No, it's just there. It's not contributing much, but it's just there. So I like to think of plants that are just there as if they're statues. So there you go. There's Dan's statue. Now, if every plant in Dan's landscape was a statue, uh, it would not be a very functional landscape. But this is just to show that it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those productive native plants, the big contributors. If we increase the percentage of these, we can tolerate these. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. Uh, you don't get more formal than that. And every single plant in that landscape is a, a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. They love them over there. If Europeans can love our native plants, maybe we can too. Can we get a pollinator garden into a suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbor it's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's pretty when it's in bloom. It's servicing several species of bees. Now, it's not very big. It could be bigger. But if everybody did it, it would help a lot. Help what? Help make pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? Uh, well, the media tells you because they pollinate a third of our crops. Uh, reality is it's closer to a twelfth of our, our crops. And I hear people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. A few of those are our crops, but think of the other plants. We need those plants. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. What about this? Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the life, life that is supported here versus the amount of life that is supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost-sharing program that is encouraging homeowners to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular. Um, Pennsylvania has a similar program now too, and I think Virginia is starting one. There's an island off of Florida, I think it's Marco Island, that is paying homeowners to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls are listed species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species in your yard, we're going to pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on, on uh, these invasive ornamentals like calorie pear. That's what St. Louis did, the Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, North Carolina's got a bounty on them. If you take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Uh, some public utilities are giving people $100 coupons to plant water-efficient native plants. And of course, the big lawn reduction programs in the far west, particularly California. This has gone up. $3 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you replace with a xeric planting. California, even though they're getting a lot of rain now, periodically, they really don't have one drop to spare on lawn. And if you want more information on all of those programs, memorize that. 
All right, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation, and the first one's serious. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. We like nature. We like to go bird watching. We like to ride our bikes or just take a walk, but it's not essential. Congress has labeled the budget for our national parks as non-essential. Well, if it's non-essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, nature will take a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save nature. We want to save wildlife so that future generations can enjoy it. This was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for, for expanding the national park system. They're beautiful places. We want to save them so the future generations can enjoy it. And I get that because nature is enormously entertaining, but it is far more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations, a little bit more serious. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about that. But if we restrict conservation just to the places where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those places are too small, too few, and too isolated. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests that there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back, not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to restore habitat viability to all those places where we've removed it. The good news is this is starting to happen. We're starting to do this. And when we do, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, since every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets. You're taught them. We've been very good at teaching this. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all, every one of us, has obligations to good earth stewardship. That does not mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, more and more people are realizing the earth has got some serious problems, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can modify their lights, one person can add a pollinator garden, one person can remove their invasive plants, one person can fire Mosquito Joe, uh, one person can do all the things I forgot to tell you. One person can, can totally revitalize the ecosystem right where they live and then enhance their greater ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park or preserve. They are all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. And I want to leave you with the Homegrown National Park Challenge. I want you to plant one keystone plant this year. One year. You got a one year to plant a plant. It'll take you five minutes. And you might say, well, that's not gonna, it's not gonna make a big difference. Well, I want 400,000 of you to do it, and it will make a big difference. So thanks very much.
All right, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Tellamy, uh Dana and Ethan being speechless, as people in this audience <laughs> will know, is is uh pretty unusual. That was amazing. Um we have lots of lots of good comments in the chat. Um Ethan, we I believe you were sort of curating some questions. Doug, do you you've got a little bit of time for a few questions, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I think just in general, I'll just throw a shout out there and say that uh, a blanket statement that many people out there were mentioning it uh, in the chat, at least the, the their participation in this project and um, having met you and been inspired by you. And it, as individuals in even the whole Master Naturalist chapter, one chapter dedicated a year to homegrown uh, national park. So, uh, yeah, we can we can answer uh, fan mail all night. So I guess I'll jump over to the Q and A. Um, yes. Uh, somebody asked us a very specific question: What kind of plant or tree can I plant in a cemetery that won't inhibit the care of the cemetery? Well, cemeteries have a lot of trees. Um, geez, I don't know what inhibits this, the care of the cemetery. I would think cemetery people would like to reduce the area of lawn that they mow. Uh, so any of the areas that are not actively, um, you know, holding graves might might be converted to a meadow. The e you know, meadow is the hardest thing to do. A planting a tree is the easiest thing to do. And I would look at the other trees in that cemetery and I would say, what's missing? Um, I would, you know, if they're all Norway maples or, or, or uh, Araucaria from South America or, or um, Dawn Redwoods from China, I get some native plants in there and I would start with oaks. They're the very best. But, but native cherries are really good. Native willows are really good. Your birches, your hickories, the things that used to be there are the ones that are going to support the most life. Um, now, you, you want to think about the guys who do mow because they're on big machines and you don't want to make it so they can't get between trees. They'll point that out right away. But, uh, you know, if you go to the caretaker of the cemetery, say, I'm going to take care of this tree. I'm going to own it. I'm going to put that bed under it. You don't have to do a thing. They'll probably say, OK, go for it. Okay, so um, here's another tricky question. This is a tough one. I used to spend hours and hours in my garden that has at least 200 native plants. But as of late, I have found ticks on me. I have had erythiosis. Now I'm afraid of my yard and have essentially given up gardening. I'm so sad. Yeah, it is a tough one. I've had Lyme disease five times. So I understand it. Wow. Um, we know why we have Lyme disease now. We know why we have have you know Borreliosis and all the you know all the things that the ticks are are delivering us. It's because we've got too many ticks, and we've got too many ticks because we've got too many deer. We have an overabundance of deer across the landscape where I live. Yesterday, my wife and I were going for a run. We passed a herd of sixteen deer before we got to the end of the driveway. Um, they're fourteen times over the carrying capacity. So the ultimate solution to these problems is get the deer back down below the carrying capacity. Uh, and eventually those tick populations will, will fall. Now I know that's hard for a single person to do, but you know, it's single homeowners who are opposing uh, deer control methods. So we need to change our, our culture and realize it's not fair to the deer and it's not fair to the forest that they're, they eat all the understory. It's not fair to the diseases you know, all the victims of the diseases, we've got to get the deer under control. Um, realize when infectivity is the worst. Where I live, it's May and June. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't get ticks other times, but uh, that's the time you really have to be vigilant. I am lucky. I said I've had it five times, but when a deer tick eats me or attaches, it itches. Uh, so wherever it is, I can feel it, and and that's good. The only time I've gotten Lyme disease is when I've ignored that itch, like between my toes and thought it was athlete's foot, stuff like that. I also get the bullseye, so I know that I have it, and then I take antibiotics, and it and it's fine. Um, I talked to a – my wife actually used to work for a, a Lyme disease researcher at Penn, and he said 
Now this is, this is, I'm not a medical doctor, so this isn't coming from me, but he said, put Neosporin, pull the tick off, put Neosporin on uh, the spot two or three times after that. It's hours before the Borrelia gets into your capillary system and the Neosporin will kill it. And ever since he told us that, and I've been doing that, I have not gotten Lyme disease. So it's anecdotal, but it sure seems to work. Um, the other thing is, you know, during those really periods of high infectivity, this is one of the good functions for lawn. Have a swath of lawn wide enough so that you can walk through your property where you don't have vegetation rubbing up against you. Ticks don't chase you. They quest. They go up to the top of a, a you know, a goldenrod or something, and they hang on with their little legs. And when you walk by, they, they grab onto you. So if you can walk around your property without brushing up against vegetation, um, you can minimize tick exposure. But, you know, it's when you're gardening, I know it's hard to do that. And I, I appreciate this, this issue. So, so you're right. I can't solve it, but those are the things we have to, we have to think about. Oh, one thing you can do. Um, there's a product that works at least to some degree. It's called Daminex and there's other names for it. It's a, it's a tube uh, with cotton in it. And the cotton has been impregnated with pyrethroids and the white footed mouse, which is the third part of that, that uh, tick deer um, lime cycle will take the cotton out of the tube and build their nest out of it. And that kills the deer ticks on the, the deer, on the deer, on the mouse, the white footed mouse. Uh, without killing the the mouse, and it's not you're not spraying the world, so it's very targeted again. Um, it's cheap. You, you might as well put them out and see if that helps at all. But um, other than that, I mean, I'm, people are spraying everything, trying to kill. Uh, 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 that, that's not the solution. Wow, that's that's enlightening. <laughs> we have we have a couple other questions here that I think I'll put two together. They're kind of similar. Uh, both are dealing with. Uh, things are trying to they've been doing the right thing with their lawn and uh in their yard space but um they planted a lot of people have planted ephemeral crocus which are old world uh natives uh nothing else blooms as early as them in our area and our crocuses are quite popular with the pollinators um i guess that's not really the um Thoughts on crocuses. Sorry, that I have another one that I was going to combine, but that's thoughts on crocuses um, with those comments that they made. Uh, it's one of the, the good compromise plants. Remember that 30% compromise? I mean, they're pretty. And you're right. They're early. They're ephemeral. Other plants will grow, go right up through them. So it's not like when you have a crocus, you can have nothing else the rest of the year. Um, many of the pollinators you see in crocuses are honeybees, which of course are not native either, but that's okay. We've got to support our honeybees too. So plant your crocuses. That's fine. Same thing with tulips, same thing with daffodils. We don't have to get rid of these things we're used to. They're not controlling the life on your landscape. It's typically the big woody plants that are doing most of the, uh, contributing or not contributing. Unless you have and the meadow contributes a lot. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We have a few questions that are really similar in regards to knowing your local keystone species, resources for identifying keystone species. I'm going to put the National Wildlife Federation plant finder in the chat again. That's it. Um, but would you, okay. Because it, can you just. They're ranked. They're ranked. So the top ones are the best. And it will tell you how many species that genus is supporting in your county. So you can see. It's an amazing resource. Um, we had a great question towards the top. Uh, I totally agree with your approach to landscaping, but I struggle with herbicide drift from lawn chemicals used by an increasing number of neighbors. I have spoken nicely, tried to share the science, but the drive to have a perfect lawn wins out. There are no lawn companies in my area that offer organic, quote unquote, care. Any ideas on dealing with that situation? <laughs> yeah, this is why we're desperately trying to change the culture. We want your approach to be dominant and your neighbors that are poisoning everything to be the outliers because peer pressure works. Um, right now, peer pressure is not with you. It's against you, but it is changing. I see it changing um, I'm surprised there's not more lawsuits, really, because do your neighbors have the right to kill everything on your yard? No, they don't. 
Um, there was a, a uh, family in Maryland that sued their HOA. Their HOA said they, they cannot have native plants and they sued them and they won. So there's a, a uh, legal precedence now. Um, education is the key. Uh, you you got it. It's very hard to go up to your neighbor and tell them they're not living right. They should be like you because that's a, that's kind of a turnoff. So I don't know. That's the secret. I've been looking for that, that secret approach to, to the non-choir for the last 20 years, but you know what? This Thanks. is taped. This is taped. Show this video to them and see if they don't rethink their approach. It is taped. That's a really good point. This recording will be on our YouTube channel um, within a couple days and will live there, as well as actually a presentation that Dr. Tallamy gave a couple years ago um, to our Birds and Bees Festival. So, yes, um, there were a couple questions about, about sharing this presentation. Very good. Um, I want to mention something, too. Uh, at the very beginning, I read um, that, of course, Dr. Tallamy has many books. Um, this is called Nature's Best Hope after one of his books, but you can get those books at your local bookstore should you have one of those, one of a dying breed. Um, you can also, of course, get them online um, in, in some of the online retailers and things like Amazon. I also want to mention that Doug has graciously donated a signed book to the Missouri River Bird Observatory auction that is coming up in April. So shameless plug for that auction. We don't have all the info up yet, but I'm going to put the link in the chat anyway, and you can get a notification for when that starts. So, um, those are some just follow-up resources. Uh, we have a question, Doug, regarding best plants for soft landings or just whatever is good for the light soil and water conditions. Yeah, you've got to go with the you know right plant, right place, the amount of rainfall you have. Don't plant things under an oak tree that require constant watering because you can kill the oak doing that. You can overwater it, particularly as you move into drier, drier areas. So you, you have to go with the the appropriate ground covers where you live. And I, you know, this is where the, the local sources, resources can, can help you. We better a ask Dan Getman's question after he was featured in there. I mean. And Dan's on here and Margie's yeah. on here also. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, geez, you know, I still have never met Dan. I do know Marty, though. <laughs> Dan is a wonderful Missouri resource um, in in the birding community, as well as sort of the native landscaping. Um, well, he's featured all over the country, and you're the first people that know who he is. You know? <laughs> Absolutely, we do. He's written articles for our newsletter and everything. He's he's a great resource. So Dan asks, with regards to the Save Leave the Leaves initiative, I've been doing that for three years now, but have a concern that with the drought and warmer temperatures, I may be creating fire hazard. Any comments on that? Yeah. Well, from the perspective of helping the plants, that's the best thing you can do because the leaves keep the moisture in the soil a whole lot better. Fire's a big problem. Um, you still have a drought? Yeah, we might we have do. another year or so of it here, actually. It's pretty bad. <laughs> One more question here. How much help is clearing? Answering, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> How much help is clearing my ranch prairie of cedar and other invasive species like winged uh, winged elm and the pear, calorie pear? Well, we'll definitely get rid of the winged elm and the calorie pear. Cedars are at least native. They do support things, but you know they used to be controlled by. Um, by bison and and fire, and we've gotten rid of both of those. So there's there's too many now. Um, we we can't manage we can't disrupt part of the ecosystem without taking over managing the rest. So we're now we say we're gardening the world, and we really are. If we're going to get rid of the natural fire controls and the big grazers that kept things open, then we have to do it ourselves. Uh, so it's a lot of work, but definitely work with those non-native invasives first because they're not they're not helping and they they go crazy. I know the cedar goes crazy too, but it 
supports a really cool little green caterpillar called the curved line angle, <laughs> which the chickadees use to feed their babies. So There's too much on our native prairies here I in Missouri, know. though. I know there are. Um, I think we have one last question here um, about how to keep deer away from your native plants once you are have them and are trying to establish them. Yeah. Uh, well, what I've done is cage them out. I don't, you know, we have 10 acres. I'm not going to put a fence around that, but um, you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you get the five foot tall galvanized wire mesh, uh, not chicken wires, way too, way too flimsy. Um, and then you make these round cages. Be, be liberal with it. Don't squeeze, you know, don't, don't make the, the trees all hug each other. Um, four or five feet in diameter, stake it with a rebar. And those cages last forever. I, I built them when we moved in, you know, 23 years ago, I am still moving those cages around. Uh, and, and then when the plant gets big enough, then that's called graduation. And I move the cage to something else. Uh, so a little bit of expense in the beginning, but you, if you're not going to have a tree otherwise, I mean, the deer will kill it when it's young. I support planting your, your trees very small because they develop that big root system. They're much healthier. They grow much faster, but they're really vulnerable to deer when they're small. So you have to put that cage around them. It looks like we have one last question. Um, and also, I know folks can see the Q&A. There's a, a nice story from Julia Hunter about one time when she met you and didn't <laughs> know that you were the speaker. <laughs> and then you were. Um, so that's really nice. I encourage people to check out that story from Julia. Um, but Melinda asks, right now, my beds are filled with leaves left to overwinter. Do you recommend raking any or all out so as not to smother young plants? So what do we all do once we've left the leaves? Do we keep leaving them? Yeah, well, just think, who was raking the leaves before we got here? The plants are much better at getting through leaves than we give them credit for. Now, if you've piled up five feet of leaves under your trees, yeah, that will smother the leaves. So you have to, or sometimes there's a, a, a backdrop and the wind blows and you get deep, deep leaf litter in different places. Then you have to do a little raking there. But normal layers of leaf litter, the plants are really good at getting getting through them. So give it a try and see see what makes it through. I've got I've got Phlox uh, divaricata. It's not a, you know, it's a delicate little thing. They come right through my my leaves without any trouble at all. So uh, wood poppies, no no problem. I don't rake because I'm not even home to do it. But um, the more you can leave there, the better the the looser the soil will be. Remember, those leaves contain the nutrients your trees used the the year before. If you rake them away ever. The nutrients are not returning to the soil, so the tree gets to use them again. It means over the years, you're starving your, your trees. So it's much better to let that, that closed nutrient cycle operate on your property rather than try to fertilize your tree and, and figure out what it, what it needs. Uh, so you want the leaves to stay there until the microorganisms and all the little leaf critters break them down and return those, those nutrients. They're also providing a, a blanket over your soil, particularly if you're having a drought, that's going to maintain the soil moisture that your, your soil community needs. And your soil community is complex. There's more species that live in the soil than above the soil. So uh, do the best you can to leave at least a healthy layer of leaves there. If there's too many, then you then, then make a compost pile. We'll put them all in one, one little pile, and but keep them on site. Ethan, are you seeing anything else? I know you've been jumping back and forth. Yeah, and yeah. Can... I've been trying to focus on the Q and A, and I think okay. it's, we've had uh, quite a few, quite a few of these have been answered well. And I think, yeah, I think we don't want to we don't want to keep our our guest all night. Who who is on Eastern time as well, where it is nine? Yeah, remember how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of lots of love to you in the chat here well, Doug, i don't know if you're seeing it all but um very seeing... inspiring as always yeah well thank you, you everybody great audience good luck to everybody 
All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night, everybody.